Good afternoon, and welcome to another episode, the fifth episode of The League of Biblical Enthusiasts. We have centered our thinking so far on the big theme of the history of the Bible, specifically the Hebrew Bible tradition, what Christians would call the Old Testament, and the great manuscripts and discoveries that we have found that lead us to understand how the Old Testament was composed, its timeline, the books that make it up, how it's composed, in what languages, and so forth. Today, we're going to take a look at the Aleppo Codex. It's one of the three great medieval Hebrew Bibles. A codex, of course, is a manuscript in book format where there is a spine and pages lay flat left to right. Much easier to find passages than in a scroll where it takes, if you're in the wrong place, you could be rolling for quite a while to get to your right passage. The three great codices of the Hebrew Bible in the medieval tradition would be Codex Sassoon, the Aleppo Codex, and the Leningrad Codex. Today we're focusing on the Aleppo Codex. Until many of its pages went missing after the Arab Revolt in Aleppo in December 1947, the Aleppo Codex was considered the oldest complete Hebrew Bible in existence. Jewish Tanakh scholars considered it the most perfect Hebrew Bible in existence. The discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls also in 1947 and the years following, changed all that in that they predate the Aleppo Codex by a thousand years. However, none of the Dead Sea Scrolls contains a complete Hebrew Bible. The Temple Scroll and the Great Scroll of Isaiah are the two largest of the Dead Sea Scrolls. The rest of the manuscripts are um, much smaller, Many are fragmentary, some as small as postcards, and even smaller. So as it stands in 2023, the state of things is that Codex Sassoon is the oldest near-complete Hebrew Bible. It's missing only 12 leaves. It precedes the earliest entire Hebrew Bible, which is the Leningrad Codex, by a century. The Leningrad Codex, Leningrad Codex dates to 1008 AD of the Christian era. Now, incidentally, Codex Sassoon will be auctioned by Sotheby's in New York City this May 2023, and some believe it could command anywhere between 30 and 50 million dollars. However, once the bidding starts, there's no telling where it's going to go. But let's go back to the Aleppo Codex and its history. The Aleppo Codex was composed in Tiberias, Israel. Tiberias is on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee, around 930 AD. The next time we see it was in Jerusalem, around 1040 AD, where it was purchased by a wealthy man named Israel ben Simcha, who dedicated it to the Kairaite community in Jerusalem. Now, side note, the Kairaites were and are a Jewish religious sect considered heretical by um, modern rabbinic Judaism. And they only recognize the Hebrew Bible as a supreme authority. In other words, they make no place and give no regard to oral law and tradition that we find in the Mish Mish Midrash or the Talmud. In Jerusalem, at this point, in 1099, the Crusaders enter on the First Crusade. They captured Jerusalem, they held the Aleppo Codex and many uh, religious texts for ransom. Egyptian Jews paid the ransom money and it was moved to Fustat, Egypt, which is near Cairo. Now by the second half of the 15th century, the Codex had somehow made its way from Egypt to Aleppo, Syria where it remained under careful guard in the great synagogue of Aleppo for almost 600 years. 
It was venerated as the most authentic Hebrew Bible and known to the faithful as the crown of Aleppo. In 1957, it appeared in Jerusalem again after a decades-long absence following the Arab uprising in Aleppo in 1947. So what happened in 1947 in Aleppo that caused the 10-year disappearance of the Codex? Well, here's the situation. On November 29, 1947, in Flushing Meadows, Queens, New York City, the United Nations held a vote which approved the creation of two states in Palestine, one for Israel and one for Arabs. The Arab world immediately rejected it, and this quickly led to war between the Arabs and the Jews in Palestine and beyond. On May 14, 1948, Israel declared itself as an independent state. And of course, the world has never been the same since, as such hatred exists between the two groups, and our news is continually being filled with sad incidents of violence, and death, uh, and destruction. And by the way, little tip, a very good TV series called Fauda, F-A-U-D-A, can be found. It is largely fictional, but it's historical fiction in that it goes into the kind of espionage, the kind of trickery and death and destruction that occurs between the Israelis and Hamas and other violent groups. It's well worth watching just for um, getting a sense of the kind of things that happen between those two. Back to the Codex. In Aleppo, on December 1st, 1947, a few days after the UN vote, the Arabs began a two-day campaign of violence and destruction against the Jews and their property. The rioters looted, destroyed Jewish property, their businesses, at least 18 synagogues, homes were destroyed, synagogues torched, and the great Aleppo synagogue, venerated by many, was burnt. They took the Torah and many other holy books and scrolls, threw them into the street and burned them. And it was feared that the Great Aleppo Codex was forever destroyed. But the story is more complicated than that. It appears that some Syrian Jews had in fact hidden the Codex. Jewish elders of the city spread the lie that it had been destroyed in order to mislead Arabs from finding it and misusing it. The most corroborated account of how the Codex survived is this. Asher Baghdadi, the synagogue's caretaker, had returned to the burned synagogue the day after the riots with his young son. He rummaged among the scrolls that were on the ground and gathered up as much as remained. After keeping the Codex for several weeks, he gave it to one of the remaining Jewish elders. The elders secretly passed it to a trusted Christian businessman whom no one would suspect having it. After four or five months, when the city had gained some semblance of normalcy, it was moved to a storeroom owned by a Jewish textile merchant in one of the old city bazaars. And there the Codex stayed undetected for 10 years. The situation for Jews in Aleppo during the 1950s was precarious. Many left after the riots of 1947, and there were few remaining in the city. Aleppo's two chief rabbis, Moshe Tawel and Salim Zafrani, were in a mood to move the crown out of Aleppo to safer ground. The opportunity presented itself in the person of Murad Faham, a Syrian Jew and local cheese merchant who had been recently received, re released from Syrian prison because he had smuggled Jews into Israel. He was only in Aleppo for a few days because the Syrian authorities allowed him to return, collect his personal goods, and then basically get out of town. The night before he was to leave Syria, he visited the two rabbis at a synagogue. At this time, Jews were not permitted to leave the city legally, but Murad Faham 
was being deported and he had a foreign passport. This was an opportunity of a lifetime to get the crown out of Syria. The two rabbis explained that the crown must be taken to Israel, given to a religious man. That would be dangerous. It must be kept completely secret. Murad agreed. The next day, Murad and his family prepared for their trip to Turkey. The crown was wrapped in a square of white fabric used for cheese. His wife placed it in a washing machine with bags of seeds and onions on top. Everything was loaded into their truck and they drove toward Turkey. The crown was on the move out of Syria for the first time in 600 years. They soon reached the town of Alexandretta on the Mediterranean around September 1957. And here there was a clothing store that also doubled as a clearinghouse to transfer Jews to Israel. It was run by the Israeli-sponsored Aliyah Department, a sister agency to Mossad. A local agent, we'll call him Mr. Isaac Silo, that's not his real name, ran the local business of escorting Jews out of Turkey into Israel, and he took special interest in Mr. Faram and his family. They made sure they were treated especially well. In December 1957, Murad, his wife Sarina, and their four children, and the Codex were on their way to Israel on the boat Marmara. They landed safely in Haifa on the 16th of December. The crown stayed in emigrations in Haifa for a few weeks and then was transferred to Jerusalem, taken to the home of Shlomo Shragai head of the Aliyah department. Shragai was an Orthodox Jew, a very religious man, and in a position of power in the new Israeli state. He was ecstatic beyond words. He soon personally delivered the crown to the president of Israel, the second president of Israel, Yitzchak ben Zvi, who deposited it in his own institute, the ben Zvi Institute, whose purpose it was to study Jewish history and culture and the important material artifacts. The crown now resides in the Shrine of the Book, part of the Israel Museum, safe and sound. We say safe and sound, and that's true to a point. You see, the Codex, as it exists today, is missing some 200 of its original 500 pages. 40% has gone missing. We have every reason to believe that it left Aleppo virtually intact. Somewhere along the way, however, many sections of the prophets from other leaves and most of the Torah were missing. It was not burned in the fire during the riots of 1947. So what happened? This may be a story of our next episode. We might call it something like the case of the missing pages of the Aleppo Codex. Before we sign off today, I wanted to remind you that tradition has it that if the Codex ever left Aleppo, bad things would happen to the city. I'm sure you are aware that the Aleppo of today is a shell of its former glory. The Syrian Civil War, 2011, and following has left this once beautiful city a hollowed out disaster. The recent earthquakes of 2023 in Turkey and northern Syria destroyed even more of this city and set it back even further. What was once a beautiful city where families gathered in peace and security, trade was fruitful, life was good, now has become a city destroyed. Is this a result of the curse of Aleppo? Many surviving Aleppo Jews believe so. I'll leave you with the before and after scene of Aleppo. Music composed by yours truly to fit the mood. Until next time, we'll see you then. Mm -hmm.